thing because it's been uh it's i mean i like python but so one of my issues with uh python has been that it's been hard to like throw together packages and it's kind of a mess compared to you know npm or or cargo for rust um so as much as i've loved python i've always had this kind of well this issue with how versioning is dealt with and stuff like that um so I've been down this road a long time, and the link in the bottom is for like the open source project that I've been working on for years and years uh, with my brother. And uh, we kind of faced this issue of you know managing dependencies for a lot of sub modules and all this mess. So so we kind of come to appreciate what like poetry brings to the table, and the sort of uh, standards that have uh, been pushed in the Python community for the for the, you know last couple of years. So basically, I mean the history is. Uh, uh, set up set up .py or your requirements.txt file where you just dump raw dependencies. Sometimes you create a separate separate requirements.txt files with the exact versions and things like that. Um, and then we ended up moving to pipenv like uh, four years ago or something. And that was a it was an improvement in some ways. It brought, it like gave us gave us hope that um, better better things were on the way. But we still had issues like some bugs were just it just brought some bugs and. Uh, it was hard to like kind of get it like to be like compatible in a nice way with the pip, which you know everyone uses. Kind of kind of annoying to have everyone to push this pip and thing on everyone, and in order to work for it to work well with pip, you like mm -hmm. use this pip and command to still generate your requirements or txt file, and you still kind of have to maintain a setup dot py file. It was just uh, it, it it was it was good, but it wasn't great. <laughs> But then, um, you know, so then the Python community has kind of realized the error of their ways and they've uh, pulled together and created this pyproject.tomless standard. And uh, let's see if my next slide is what I think it is. And, you know, uh, we've all seen this like XKCD of like uh, how standards proliferate. And uh, as soon as someone creates a new standard, it's, you know, now you have more competing standards than you have before instead of a new standard that took over everything. But um, what pyproject.tomless basically is, it's a file that um, it specifies the build system and it allows for like arbitrary configuration for any tools you might use. So for the example of poetry, it's, you know, specify a small segment that says this project uses poetry and then you specify another segment, which is the poetry segment that says these are the dependencies, these are the development dependencies, these are some metadata, metadata for metadata <laughs> for the package and uh, things like that. So it's, um, and you know, it's just like more convenient because pip supports pyproject.com. So if you just pip install dots in the project folder, it will pick it up, it will check the build system, it will install the build system like transparently, and then it will run through the whatever steps needed to build the thing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of this kind of what's needed about pyproject.com. And uh, I mean, the, so the main, so what everyone is excited about is poetry because poetry seems to be you know, the most well-backed, the most supported, um, you know, seems to work the best kind of solution that everyone has been looking for. So it's basically the NPM or cargo equivalent for Python. So it comes with, it supports your pyproject.tom file for specifying your dependencies um, and specifying like basic version requirements, such as minimum versions. Um, and then, in, you know, and, and that's kind of also supports uh, the semantic versioning notation that you have in NPM packages and things like that that are supposed to have meaning, uh, but they don't always they don't have they don't always carry meaning you know what does a minor version increase mean what does a major version increase mean it's not always well defined it's more um the semantic versioning is definitely more you know um well developed in the uh, node ecosystem um but but what poetry does that is common in other systems like ecosystems is that it creates version locks and stores them in the poetry.lock file so when you run poetry in let's say ci uh, for like testing you will always have the same versions of your dependencies um, which is, you know, important so that if someone contributes a change like a week before the last commit, their the CI won't suddenly break because some dependency downstream had updated and now you're using the new one instead of the one you were using before. So, um, so things are loud. It's just like nice. I, I guess that's sort of a brief summary. I mean, I made a I, I made the PR to the re to the repository. Um, sort of just, I had like a, an issue with a minor dependency and then I got a bit carried away and I was just, let's just like, let's just rewrite the setup configuration in, um, in poetry, which is, you know, typical me to get carried away like that. But, um, uh, that's what happened. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think, I think it will save time down the line. But as always, when you learn a new tool, 
it's um there's a this this like a starting curve or um yeah yeah to like get on board and uh, but 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 I think how poetry managed it with like being very compatible with pip through the pyproject.com file is really nice so uh, I think it's a good thing. No, that that's that's great. And um, when you say it also handles like build issues, does yeah. I mean with with a Python project, are you talking about something you know like where it's got you know C C plus uh, uh, plus? Yeah. So I mean, so, I mean, I mean, so I mean, usually when you build C C people plus stuff, it's usually some downstream dependency. I mean, you can definitely integrate that into your tool chain using pyproject.com. I'm not super familiar with how that works. I haven't done it myself, but you know, I've scrolled through a few like guides or whatever and people are doing it, so. Um, sure, yeah. sure. A and um, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and how much in your own projects is it, uh, is it helping with say multi-platform support in, in some, you know, significant way or, you know, yeah. what, what what you know kind of like what what real itch did it scratch for you in in right. your own work uh right yeah uh so i guess i guess the issue we've had is mostly uh, like maintaining these setup.py files across like tens of repositories and you always have to kind of write them yourself they're always kind of like a home written hack where you you open your requirements.txt file and you you parse it and you it and you dump it into the install requirements like uh, keyword arguments and to you know stuff like that and then we had issues with um i don't know it's uh, I, I think i think one of the main things really uh, has been like the, the lock file because with the lock file you can make sure that you get the same sets of set verse same versions every time um which just wasn't possible before. like sure you, you could you could like dump down a requirements.txt file from your, uh, from your, you know, pip list output or whatever. But, um, but then, you know, sometimes you don't get the same version because a hash changes under you or something. And I don't know, it, it just, it just hadn't been reliable for us. Um, and, and we, I mean, we, we worked at a slow pace. So as, as we took a month break and didn't do anything, suddenly things started breaking. And that was just like, we didn't want to start off every time we sat down with the code to have to um, redo like uh, you know, fix a few bugs and because some dependency updated under our, under our feed. Gotcha. Yeah. And and um, so in in your own projects, or certainly you know a lot of our projects, we're we're using you know what I would call scientific Python, the scientific Python stack, you know, yes, or computational like computational Python. Um, you know, and for somewhat for those reasons. You know, we're we're very tend. You know, a lot of us uh, tend to use actually Anaconda. Or, you know, use Conda. Yeah. Um, do, are you using Conda yourself at all? And can you say anything about like issues that between those? Um, not not really. I mean, I, I've used Conda in school. Like that's what that's what the academics tend to push on you. In the, uh, it's my experience it anyway. Um, but but I don't know. I think I mean I see Conda a lot in like academic context. But as soon like, but as soon as I go to something that is more uh, like say, industrial or Python in production, it's uh, I, I never see Conda, and I, I I I'm not experienced enough to say why that is, but um, but I, it's the case. So <laughs> it, it, it's 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 funny, yeah. the the last yeah. the last in person hackathon that we had, um, a guy who I now recognize is is somebody from Facebook came, and and I was like, so do you have Conda installed? And he looked at me like. No, no, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 he was he was like I, I use pip, you know, <laughs> like you know, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. The, 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 um, you know, the subtext being like like a normal person, <laughs> or like, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean it's so, um, so another thing that so I, I didn't make clear. I guess what, what poetry another problem that poetry solves and the pip end also solved before it is that it manages the like a virtual environment for you. So in your documentation, there there is no you have to create this virtual environment first. You have to you know run this magic Python command and activate the shell script, blah blah blah. 
if, if you if you run poetry install and you're not already in a virtual environment, it will create one for you. And uh, if you just if you want to run commands in the environment, you can either you know run poetry shell, which opens the shell with the environment activated, or just run like poetry run and then your command, and it will so run things. So very very cool. What, yeah. what it brings in terms of making uh, distributions uh, like wheels and source distributions, uh, does it uh, fix issues? Uh, usually in Python, it hits, hits uh, enemies uh, historically been. You never know what to put in manifest, what to put uh, in fine packages yeah. and stuff like that. So th this uh, Py, uh, uh, Py project, Tomal, is it, is it solving some of those issues? So I, I think uh, I, I, I can speak to what like Pi Project solves in that regard in general, but poetry in that regard, I mean, um, you know, you, in your usual adopt a Pi file, you have your find packages uh, sort of, you know, call, mm -hmm. um, and it, it works so so. You know, there there was some issue, for example, in EG notebooks where the CLI wouldn't run for some instance, for some example, like for some reason after a pip install, and the reason I, I'm pretty sure came down to like. A faulty, you know, find packages call, which just didn't detect the sub package where the CLI module was. Um, so, I mean, with regards to wheels, uh, I'm, I'm less experienced. I'm less experienced with like building binary wheels. Um, I usually like have them handled for me somehow, um, and manifest files. So, you know, I, I've been down that road a few times, but I don't. <laughs> I haven't had enough issues with it to know a lot about it. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't had to worry about manifest files anyway. Um, so I think we removed ours like a while ago in, in the few places we had them. I don't quite remember how we did that, but I mm -hmm. think I'm pretty sure they're gone. Um, I have a, um, a few questions on it. Is this kind of related to the question of um, like distributions and environments? Um, uh, can you hear me okay? I think I've paused. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so. So Eric, one of the reasons, just like specifically in terms of VG notebooks right now, like one of the things that we, um, the way, like a decision we've taken about how to try and support things is to is to use a anaconda for for two reasons. One, the one that Morgan just described is it's kind of the default scientific um, Python distribution at the moment. But the other is it gives us a shell um, that we need to do stuff and we kind of get both of those at the same time. And I, was, I wasn't I was really sure, well, firstly, I, I looked in, I mean, I didn't put a lot of time into this, but I had a little go at the two like Windows, well, and the other part of this is like, this is in Windows. So I'm not um, like any more a fan of Windows than I have to be. It's like a necessary yeah. evil, but it's a necessary evil that exists for the majority of people who need to do stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, computationally, I'm mostly working on a grid and doing high performance computing stuff. But in the context of hardware EEG stuff, we're, work, we're in Windows. I mean, this is like, this is like the, the reality. So yeah. um, I tried doing poetry, two times of types of poetry install, and um, I didn't get very far with either of them. But the other thing is I w I'm, I'm a bit unclear about where where it's sitting in terms of a Python distribution, a Python um, stack or environment manager, and um, yeah, uh, a um, build uh, packet packaging manager, right? So, do is is there like a default Python distribution that comes with Poetry, or or do you have to install? Um, will it find no. an installed no. distribution from somewhere? Yeah. So yeah, I think I can. So I, I can get your question out. But I, I'm not sure what you meant about the conda shell. But I guess. Um, but with regards to like distribution, yes, it, it uses like the default Python version that you have running. And if you want to run something else, you I guess you'll have to. Uh, you know, uh, what? How do, how do I do that? I do that somehow. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it doesn't manage your Python versions for you. If if that was your question. Um, and. Uh, I suppose, like where it is in the stack. I mean, it's like uh, it, it manages. You know, it, it's it's kind of like a, a, a layer around like virtual ends and pip and versioning for those things, and everything else is left to you. Um, 
more or less. Right. So, so in, um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get your windows. Hey, John, how's it going? Hi, hi Jaden. I'll just I'll just answer what he was saying about the shell though, because <clears throat> um, yeah. So for the for the kind of the application we have here, um, the entry point is, or the install, yeah, the entry point is open up your Anaconda shell, and then run run the Python code, right? And now we have a CLI, but otherwise it's like fire fire up a Jupyter notebook, or do some stuff that, um, and then and also activate your Python environment for your Conda shell. Now you could, you could, I guess, access the, the Conda Python installation via a different shell, but I've never done that before and I don't know if that works. Um, and the, like I said, the, the kind of the user side of this that we're, we're aiming for is um, we need to, we need to have a, a kind of fairly uniform, like, this is this is the, the where you go to do things. So I'm not clear if using poetry we should be kind of going somewhere other than an anaconda shell. And if so, is that going to have like the same functionality? And will it? Would it access? Yeah. Like, do we have to tell it special things to get it to access an installed version of anaconda? If we do, and also related to that is using poetry within conda environments like does that make sense yeah it makes sense uh, if, if you're in a conda environment you can just pip install poetry and then run poetry install and do things as normal um you should anyway uh, i mean that, that's how that's like my normal workflow except instead of a conda environment i'm in a manually configured vir virtual environment sometimes um, okay so that, that should work as normal. And then if you don't like, if you don't want to use poetry for whatever reason, you can just pip install dot and it will install like you know, the package as if it was a dependency of something else. So it won't use the, it won't use the package log file, uh, but it will install, you know, the latest ver supported version of everything that is specified in the dependency list. Um, but I, I, I'm not quite sure how, how you like your conda workflow looks, but, um, but I mean, the equivalent of activating a con environment is just running poetry shell, um, and that opens that, that activates the virtual environment and puts you in the sh in like in your normal shell, but with the environment activated. Um, so that's that's a command that that is installed when you install poetry poetry shell. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Poetry space shell. So it's like a sub shell uh, sub command of poetry. All right. But but if, if you had issues installing poetry in different ways, uh, I would suggest just like running pip install poetry because that that has does, done it for me every time. Um, yeah, I was trying to do a non anaconda install because I wasn't clear. I think you've cleared that up for me now. I wasn't sure if running poetry inside anaconda and specifically inside a conda environment was made I, sense because poetry is yeah. supposed to be doing environment management. I, I think if you install like if you install poetry itself within an environment, you might have issues. But it works. It has worked for me before. I think I've stumbled upon something once where a version of something that poetry used in the environment conflicted with a version that I needed for some other project. But like, um, I mean, I, I would still recommend installing you know poetry on your system level. But then you can run it in your environments however you like. It will respect the current environment, like, so to speak. Even though it is not directly in it. Hmm. I mean, there, there's definitely there's definitely some some things we really like about that pull request that would be you know it, it's coming with I mean, a lot of great features. I mean, and, I, I can rebase the thing, and we can you know we can cherry pick some things out. <laughs> like we don't have to do it all in one go. It was just. Uh, it was what I did, and I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time cherry picking things out before I knew what you wanted. So, well, um, I mean, I, you know, it, John, John's in the in the details a lot more than than I am, but I just I know that like we do have definitely some some things that are different on Windows than than on on Mac and Linux. Um, mm -hmm. You know, prim, pr primarily around the the kind of like the driver interface and. Um, and just just for those uh, joining us, especially um, uh, you know, 
people for joining us for the first time, we're talking about this uh, EEG notebooks project, and I'll let me put a I'll put a link in the chat. Um, and this is um, well, this is. Uh, sorry, this is the documentation, but um, yeah, okay. And Roman's put in the, the link. And um, yeah, so I know along with the along with the, the PR is, I mean, what's coming is also, you know, getting us uh, better integrated with, uh, I think, GitHub's continuous integration. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. So, oh yeah, actually, I, I don't think I did that in PR, but it's like a it's like a one line change to uh, make sure that it also runs in Windows and Mac. So, uh, yeah, just to make sure that things don't break there, you know. Great, 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 great. Um, and um, yeah, so like, uh, don't don't feel on the spot uh, to you know fully defend uh, everything poetry. It's really it's really like it uh, it definitely seems intriguing enough that that. Uh, yeah, like everybody's everybody's interested. Um, I know that, like you said, like academics kind of, are, you know, I, I think of it more as like academics who are doing, you know, computational stuff. Uh, but you're right; it's like pretty much anybody who's pushing. Mostly, people who are pushing Python on people for the first time might be pushing Conda, you know, yeah. and. Um, and you know, I th I think we'd kind of uh, I mean, is this sound right, John? Like and Jaden, like we'd been kind of pushing in the documentation on the using you know Conda environments, you know, more than say virtual you know VMs. I think you were, I mean you were fairly accommodative, but it, yeah, it was definitely pushing on Conda. Yeah. Uh, my mic's not too loud now, is it? Or is it still loud? I, well, I, I, I yeah yeah yeah, it's better. Okay. Um, so we push towards Conda definitely, but I actually still use virtual env. I uh, I don't use the like Conda at all. So. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was really. Um, the, if we if we pushed it was to it was. To try and have a. A, a simple description. Um, that isn't like you you can do things ten different ways, um, but but we also want to be inclusive. Um, for, for so totally like, if people are, are comfortable doing things in other ways, then that that's fine. But we also don't want to kind of confuse people by giving them ten different options, in uh, you know too too much. That uh, that was really the re the rationale as far as it goes, and particularly in terms of Windows. Um, when the windows use case like con anaconda seem to be the you know does seem to be the best option best distribution option and also like i said the best terminal option um because i mean I, otherwise in windows i don't know if people have good suggestions but like powershell's rubbish or at least it, it, I, i'm not a big fan of powershell and um the, so the con so like i said it's kind of it's not a big thing but it it shouldn't be a big thing, but it is a big thing in a way. Is that with Conda we get the Python environment and we get um, a button that you click to to do things, or that you can stick in your in your you know browser bar at the bottom, um, and rather than saying access the Windows shell and um, well, I, I just know I just never have positive experience with PowerShell. I'm probably not it might be unique yeah. there but uh, I, mean, I, I i share your uh, i share your concern i mean I, I always like use git bash when i'm on windows just because you know right it's like bash <laughs> yeah um, yeah same and i'm same. and i'm kind of i'm kind of hoping that like you know wsl2 or you know will will take yeah. over you know and uh, i'll just always have you know Let's say Ubuntu <laughs> Bash. Yeah, yeah. Once they have the hardware integration with that, then you know, screw Windows basically. But until then, um, just just like yeah. ever, you know. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, su su super appreciate it, uh, Eric. Really, really, uh, you know, great, great to have someone giving us the pr perspective. 
yeah and um uh any any extra questions um and and uh, i forget which which device do you have Varric? do you you've got uh, well, i i have the like ultra cortex with a with a siphon okay. And I have, okay. uh, but I have, I have the Muse S that I've been using to collect data, like while I'm just sitting um, in front of the computer and doing stuff uh, as part of my thesis stuff. It's on my GitHub if anyone cares. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah, I haven't been doing a lot with the uh, Ultra Cortex actually, um, but but I, I've been getting the Muse to work okay for like for my use case. Some signal issues, but sometimes, but like it seems fine. Like the analysis seems to work anyway, so yeah, it's alright. So well, have you been doing continuous streaming? Uh, continuous your... is a bit of a stretch, but I'm I'm doing yeah. I'm doing five five minute chunks, and then I do another five minute chunk and another five minute chunk. Um, yeah. Right. Yep. That that's that's something that we probably need to do. I'm trying to. I think a few people know I'm I'm getting going on a Muse S based sleep project, and um, we've been. I think we'll probably continue to be back and forth between um, using Muse Monitor, probably uh, the mobile app for data collection, and trying um, a Muse LSL um, laptop-based version. Um, but the problem is, like, you try and do a recording for eight hours, and you just get a random Bluetooth drop at some point, and you lose your entire data stream unless you have, you know, unless you build in something like five-minute recording chunks. Saving yeah. and then I, 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 I think there, as well. I mean, I, I think there are better ways to do it. It's just that I mean, I just did it this way because it's the fastest. I don't, I don't really care about like continuous. But if you would want to do it continuous, um, I mean, Muse LSL uses LSL, and the Muse LSL like to record function. I mean, that's the real limitation is that it, it waits for five minutes, and if it crash, if like the record function crashes, then what it has read from the stream so far will crash with it. So if you just yeah. like make sure that it writes continuously to a file instead of opening the file and then waiting for everything and then dumping it, um, I mean that, sh that that should work too. Is, but um, but yeah, I haven't really gone super. But it's a, it's a pretty short function that does the recording. So I I, I looked into it, but I haven't actually like fixed it so to speak. Okay. All right. Well, um, super appreciate it. Thanks again. And um, I just wanted to um, mention that, you know, John is going to be doing uh, Brain Hack Ontario, which would be a, a local event um, coordinated with Brain Hack Global 2020, which is December 2nd to the uh, 4th. I mean, Brain Hack Ontario is. Um, which is a great chance to use that uh, Open BCI Ultra Cortex um, to collect some uh, ERP data, <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so this is this is what EEG notebooks is is really uh, is really about, which is you know uh, a, a nice um, you know um, a, an e easy to use framework for both wrapping PsychoPy and you know and drivers for for acquisition. You know, Muse LSL with uh, with Muse, but uh, Brainflow for um, which Jaden incorporated for um, Open BCI and for uh, Unicorn Black and um, and Neurosity um, headsets among, among others, and um, yeah. So I, uh, I, yeah, I, little, little comment on that as well. I mean, so anyone, I I haven't yet. It's on my to-do list this week, early this week, to uh, shout out to the world about this. Um, so far, I've been taught, like just filling in a few people um, who I've spoken to or a few conversation groups I'm in. But um, anyone who's interested, I, I definitely want to pull in as many people who are interested in doing any any development project they have a, a cool idea for or something that they, if they just want to contribute or if they just or if they want to try out doing some data recordings. I want to get in everyone who who wants to be kind of a part of this this cool international group um, for during this period, ideally really the 2nd to the 4th of December. And we'll kind of have a, 
a tapered window, let's say, either side of that. Um, but to kind of spread the word. If any of the guys on this call are interested, then um, like we can we can talk offline and spread the word. Really like to get a global group of people doing a sprint on um, EG Notebook second to the fourth, and looking forward to seeing some new ideas that people bring in. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I'd love to have some some subgroups where we're working on some of these new headsets that are now available with uh, with you know via via Brainflow, right? So you know, um, at least you know, like I said, John, uh, I've been talking to the the chapter lead in in LA who's uh, an early Neurosity user, but you know, Neurosity or yeah, Neurosity early Notion users say. But Neurosity has got a lot of programmers um, that uh, that use that headset, and I think I think it's just pretty natural that we could get a bunch of them together uh, to uh, again, like it can be recording data, it can be you know uh, uh, adding adding better support for the headset itself, or and um, this is going to lead into naturally lead into Igor's presentation, uh, uh, adding adding some experiments. And um, uh, yeah, and uh, oh, okay. Sorry, you guys are talking about um, ah, okay, yeah. E e free EG thirty two is definitely um, something. Yeah, w we can. You know, I, I'm hoping that we'll also have a small group talking about that. Um, Bernard's joined us. Uh, Andres, Andres already joined us here. Um, you know, even if it's even if it's just working on um, uh, let's fl fleshing out um, some of the documentation issues with free EG thirty two, <laughs> and uh, uh, for instance, um, but um, but yeah, let's let's uh, if we can switch over to um, I want to uh, give Igor a chance to talk about uh, Pi files. And Igor, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, this is your first time here. Yeah, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks, Morgan, for inviting me. Uh, well, my background is in software engineering. I'm a professor of software engineering at the University of Novi Sad and mainly researching in the area of uh, language engineering, and special domain-specific languages. So uh, I get into this field. <laughs> of neuroscience quite by accident. <laughs> uh, my wife, he, she's researching in the neurophysiology. Okay. And usually during um, her recordings of a brain waves, uh, she usually administer some uh, psychological test to the subject. Uh, so uh, we made those tests uh, initially using available libraries and writing code manually. But then uh, we realized, why don't we make something to make uh, li our life easier? And since there are a lot of great options in the domain of uh, GUI builders, you have, for example, uh, Open Sesame and various other, for example, Gorilla and stuff like that, that, that are GUI based. But uh, I'm always be more fond of uh, textual editing uh, because I can use the Git and all the text textual tools I use every day. So. Uh, I look around, and the only options were uh, PsychoPy and um, uh, library-based uh, tools. So you work in Python, but you use some library. Uh, and in the domain of domain-specific languages, there are no, not many options. So uh, that that is how PyFlice is born. Uh, we made initial release, initial implementation several years ago, and the project remained mostly dormant since then. And again, we picked up uh, maybe two months ago. <laughs> so that's something uh, good from uh, this Corona crisis. Crisis, yeah. You know, <laughs> we have some time to <laughs> to do some other stuff. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think the best the best uh, way to to show you guys uh, what is PyFlight is to to do a live demo. So that's the famous last words, right? So I'll, I'll just quickly uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, well, we can see ourselves. <laughs> okay, yes, that, that's what you should see. Sure. 
<laughs> so, uh, so the the pipelines is uh, the main specific language uh, implemented in Python, and uh, it has an extension for Visual Studio Code at the moment. And I will just quickly show you how you can, for example, uh, create some experiment. Uh, for this purpose, I will create a Stroop experiment. Uh, I guess probably you know for the Stroop uh, effect and the Stroop experiment. Uh, should I ex explain? Do you know what is the Stroop? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, sure. OK. It's an experiment in which uh, you show the, the, the words to the, to the subjects. And the words are the words of the colors. For example, red, green, blue, and so on. And the words can be colored in different colors. <laughs> and it is uh, shown that uh, if the verb is colored in a, in a different color, for example, you, you see the word red and it's colored green, uh, the, the brain needs more time to process information because uh, uh, subconsciously you're reading the word. And if you uh, have to react to the color of the word, then it will uh, take you more time to actually analyze uh, the, that it's not the, the, the color you're reading, right? So in, the, in that experiment, you're, you need uh, to have several colors. And I'll start here by just first creating Stroop file. Uh, the extension is PF for pipelines. And uh, since it's a domain-specific language, we are using domain-specific concepts. So in, in our domain, uh, that is the concept of a test. So I start by typing test. And we are offer, offered by code snippet for the test. So just pressing tab, it is unrolled. And I will provide the name for the test. It is Troop. And then here, we see a nice uh, table. It's a markdown table. So it's a pure text where we describe our conditions. In psychological experiments, uh, you have a series of trials. And in each trial, you have some variable that change over trials. So for example, in this case, we have words and colors. So let's just say that my var variable is word. And the second variable is color. OK. And now I will create here uh, colors will be uh, my color with the red and green. Let's make it simple for this little experiment, just two colors. And here I will say, OK, my word will be colors loop. And my color will be colors loop. What I'm creating here is uh, I'm creating my condition table by looping over this array of colors. So word will be a loop over colors, so words red and green. And then for each word, I will have colors looping over colors. So up again, red and green. So in total, we'll have four, four uh, rows in this table. And to make it uh, more nice, uh, I usually make a congruent column or variable, which uh, says, says is if this uh, trial here is congruent or not. It will be congruent if the word uh, corresponds to the color. So if the word is equal to the color, it is congruent. And that's it. We have this nice little table. And the second part of this test is uh, specifying our actual stimulus that will be uh, displayed to the subject. So in the pipelines to make uh, things more structured, we decided to divide um, our each hour trial in three phases. So we have this picture phase. So this phase fix uh, uh, will happen first. And when that finish, we have this execute phase, which is the main phase of the trial. And then after this execute completes, we have error or correct, well, uh, depending on whether in this execute phase, the subject responded with the expect expected response. So uh, this phase here, fixture, and this error correct, uh, they're optional. Uh, the experiment to test will, uh, will need only the execute phase. OK, now let's go back to the experiment. So this fix is optional, but let's create a fixture. Fix phase will show the cross. And let's say it is shown for exact for 500 milliseconds, for example. And here on the left side, this is uh, 
a Boolean variable. So fix is a Boolean variable that is evaluated during uh, evaluation of the test and will be true during the picture phase. So uh, this is not just a simple word, it is actually a Boolean expression. So I can say, for example, fix and uh, color is green. To say show this cross only on, in the picture phase when the color is green. So it's very powerful. You can create uh, various condition on the left side. And uh, here, this is a exec, again, Boolean variable that is true during execution. And here we will, we will say, can you see my screen? Should I maybe increase a little bit? A little bit? Uh, that, that certainly helps if it, uh, that one's perfect. Okay, okay. So for execution, uh, we say, okay, when the cross is over, so uh, 500 milliseconds pass, and now you, we need a word displayed uh, to the subject. Uh, we, we use a component text, and the content will be word. I'm here referencing actually the, I'm here referencing this variable here, right, word. So this is the connection, right? I can do that for uh, during the definition of these components here. And duration of a word will be indefinite because uh, I want a uh, word to be displayed until the subject reacts with the keyboard, with the key press. And another thing I need to specify is the color of the word. So the color will be color. Again, this color is uh, from the table, the current uh, value of this color in the table. Okay. And another component will be keyboard component, where we can provide what are the valid responses and what is the correct response. So the valid uh, response will be colors. All valid, uh, all color, colors is valid, valid response but the correct one will be just the color. So the current color from the condition table. Okay, and more or less, this completes the, the test. If you look now at the test, it's a very short description. And the next, Thing we could do, for example, is to define some message to the user to describe what is uh, this all about. So we have concept of a screen for that. So we create screen introduction, and the screen contains just the text that will be shown to, to the subject. So, for example, something like "Welcome, uh, you need to react to the color of the word." And then, for example, press uh, left for red and right for green. Okay, this is instruction to the subject, what will happen. And at the end, we just define the flow and say, first show intro and then execute stroop. And when executing a troop, randomize all the trials. So we don't want them executed in the order defined, but random. Okay, that's the test. And the final touch to this test, because we want to, uh, we want this to execute on uh, PsychoPy. Uh, that's the first generator built for this language. Let's first uh, see how, uh, we can transform this representation into some something different. For example, I can generate from this troop log target, which is the very first thing I usually do to see if my experiment is uh, OK. Uh, this log is a plain text that describes uh, your experiment in greater detail. You can use, for example, uh, folding that is provided by default for uh, inside the Visual Studio Code to see actually what will execute. First, the screen will be shown to the subject with this co content, and then, and then this test will run. 
And you can see the test is, the table is expanded. There is four, there are four rows, right? And the random will be true. And you can see the trials. Each trial of the test you can see here with all the details. For example, I can open this second trial and see that in that trial, the word will be red, but it, the color will be green and it will not be congruent, right? And the phases will be like this. Fix, picture phase is more or less, it's always the same, but the execute phase is different because it depends on the current uh, variable in the current trial. Okay, so the correct response is green because the color is green, uh, but content will be red. So the textual content display will be red. Okay, now let's go to finalize this and generate PSYCHOPY code. Uh, for this, we uh, need to provide the target configuration. So for PSYCHOPY, we uh, need to provide the mapping because the keyboard here uses colors as an abstract term. If you uh, look at the experiment, we, uh, we try to be as much abstract as possible. I didn't provide uh, here the, the keyboard keys, which will be pressed, but only the colors. So the colors here represent the color, the words, the color, sexual colors of those words, and the keys at the keyboard. So everything is mapped to the colors, to, to these two symbols, red and green. Uh, so for this to be complete, we need to say for PsychoPy, actually in the content, in the context of a keyboard component, our red should map to left and our and our right, right should map to sorry our green should map to right okay now let's generate our experiment to psychopi if we could say that our target is psychopi we get this Python file generated. Well, it's a lot of code, as you can see. Uh, it could be made, made shorter. If you are developing this by hand, uh, it could be made shorter, but it will still be a lot of code compared to this little experiment I just demonstrated here. So it's, this is very readable and very short. And for this, you actually need some programming experience to do correctly. And, and let's yeah yeah i mean but that's that's totally you know that's very common with uh with dsl generated uh, you know i mean the the kind of the point is that the the dsl description is is um you know is the efficient one <laughs> exactly yeah and, the, yeah that was the point uh, uh but uh the current offering in the in the in this area uh, was uh, not so very good, at least to, to in my view. Uh, what I found as a DSLs in in area of psychological experiments uh, is a pebble. It's a tool called Pebble. But uh, although it used some kind of concept from um, this domain, it's more or less. Uh, more or less general purpose. So if you look at the pebble, it it just uh, feels like general purpose. You have loops, you have ifs, you have functions, you have parameters, everything. So not much of a concept from the real target domain. Another one is, I think it's called DMD or something like that, or DMX, if I remember correctly. But it's, it's a very old uh, DSL and very cryptic. So if you look at the code, it, it resembles more the machine language. If you've, if you've got links for those, uh, I'd be very interested. Um, sure. uh, you know, I, I, I certainly am familiar with, with experimental control systems going back mm -hmm. to the 90s, <laughs> which, you know, seems like, uh, seems like, you know, medieval periods. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was actually um, talking with, uh, I think it was talking with Jonathan Cohen about uh, PsyScope. Um, and I, you know, again, I'm probably dating myself. <laughs> uh, 
But yeah, if if anybody can remember actually writing code for Mac OS at Mac OS Classic, <laughs> this is you know that 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 used to dominate uh, experimental control systems, and um, uh, in particular, this this one was very famous for for mm -hmm. language language experiments. Um, or it certainly came out of start started with mostly language experiments and um, and it, it turned out that that you know Mac OS Classic actually was kind of kind of perfect for experimental control systems without you um, needing to write uh, you know for for EEG integration um, just because because it wasn't a multitasking operating system <laughs> you could. You could take over the OS, and you could get really, really accurate timing from the system. But uh, because it was right. a quote cooperative, uh, um, multi uh, cooperative um, operating system, <laughs> you could just be a be a bad actor, basically. And, yeah, uh, control. You have to take hold the control. <laughs> <laughs> you could hold the control. So, so uh, you know. The, the company I used to work for, Electrical Geodesics, was was all built with Mac OS Classic systems, and mm -hmm. our, our EEG experimental control program was also Mac OS Classic, <laughs> as well as you know um, uh, the Smith Kettlewell I Research Institute uh, uh, had a uh, for for you know these visual psychophysics experiments that required incredibly tight uh, uh, timing control. Mm -hmm. They were also based on Mac OS Classic and, um, and really old really old drivers um, for national instruments cards, because um, I think they were using those for, for triggers. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, and, and what's, your, what's your wife, uh, is she doing clinical research or is that more, um, Psychology research. Uh, well, she, yeah, she's um, in a narrow psychology, and uh, she, she teaches at the university also. And um, what she's uh, mo studied the most is, uh, I think it's called P three hundred signals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's uh, recording P three hundred and correlating to var various, you know, uh, state of the mind, yeah, like focusing or doing some stuff you know and uh, uh, making those, those correlations so uh, at least that's how I, I understand that <laughs> not my area no, no. But... I mean it's 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 kind of perfect because it's it, you know it's really exactly what we what we mostly talk about or is mm -hmm. doing doing these kinds of um, you know ERP mm -hmm. experiments and um so when i you know so i didn't even know that when i saw when i saw your post on the on the psychopi forum um you know didn't didn't realize that you were coming at it from from exactly our perspective which is like using using psychopi for for erps um mm -hmm. and you know which is which is really a subset of their experiments right um uh, a, a lot of people are just doing behavioral experiments yeah um, and um yeah so i mean certainly you know the the other the other big goal of of using dsls especially over say uh, say builder i mean have you i mean hopefully what you can do with the dsl is actually a much more complicated task that you would not want to try building with a with a, a builder tool, right? Exactly. Uh, if you want to do something more complex with the builder, you need to uh, to use those code uh, components to actually write the Python code. So uh, when you do that, that, that gets very complex because, uh, in my view, you have a GUI that hides stuff from you. So uh, you, you see the overall structure, but you had to dig into each of these code, code components to see the Python code, and then to fit everything into your head. What will, uh, how the end result, you know, what will you will get at the end? Mm -hmm. Because you're putting pieces together, like you know. So uh, sure. that, that kind of breaks uh, the, the 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 
major benefits of uh, the builder. You know, the builder is a kind of DSL, but graphical. You know? Right, right, yeah. right. Um, yeah, and and ha have you dug into? You know, I, I see on the on the documentation. You know, Open Sesame and um, you know JS Psych uh, experiment. Have you have you looked at those much, or did you just have those ex as examples and? Uh, well, I uh, I looked uh, at both of those tools uh, several years ago, but didn't yeah. uh, look recently. I think yeah. I watched some videos about Open Sesame uh, recently, and I see it's very powerful GUI tool for building the experiments. So you can do much with uh, with the, that GUI approach. But uh, again, uh, it it's not for you know for everyone. Uh, sure. Some folks that are probably more experienced prefer uh, actually coding and using Git, and especially if you have a team of uh, of uh, people that uh, have a battery of tests, and then you want to track history of changes and to see differences and to try something different. The Git is a perfect tool for that. Mm. Uh, and when you have plain text description, it's uh, everything gets much easier because uh, you're. Uh, a visual representation of your experiment and your storage representation. So what your is stored on your file in your file system is the same, uh, and you can compare things. You know you can use uh, command line tools like diff, and you know you can grab through your <laughs> through your experiments and stuff like that. So uh, and, and you can collaborate. You know you can merge changes. Do, so, do yeah. you have yeah, so so certainly, you know, for our own um, our own usage of tools like Psychopy, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the main thing that Psychopy doesn't have uh, naturally, or sort of, you know, it's not it's not the first first thing that the developers are thinking about is how to um, not only generate the experiment, but to send out signals, send out triggers. You know, send out uh, um, timing timing signals so that um, the hardware system that is recording can can know when you are putting up things. Do you have have you got any of those? You know, is is that something where like because Psychopy has some things we we would be able to add that. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, uh, Pipeflies uh, is. They're relatively early in the development, so it's still O point something, <laughs> still not okay. 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 But uh, in this in this stage, I would I would really uh, like if people could uh, you know provide feedbacks for various use cases. Sure, uh, sure. So, I see. Yeah, if if you have some specific use case, uh, I would really like if you can uh, just register your your use case at the at the issue tracker of Pipeflies. Sure. Uh, so I can just uh, you know build a roadmap where this language would go in what in which di direction. Currently, sure. uh, those components are uh, pretty much abstract. You can uh, you can build whatever you want with those components. E even those components are built with the DSL. You, I could uh, show you quickly if I just share the screen. For example, if you go to this components uh, section of the documentation, you will see that the components are written, you know, like code. So you can see the the component name, yeah. what it, it's extend, and uh, what is the parameter of a component, what are the value, uh, the types, and what is the default default value, and what is the description. And this this actually piece of the documentation is automatically generated from those descriptions. So Components are described like this in, in the in the uh, Pipeflies uh, so source code, and currently this language is not exposed to the user. But uh, in the future version, I could expose this DSL, so you can build your own component, just describe it, and then extend the generator to generate whatever code you want from that. So hmm. in that case, uh, probably you know you can fit whatever uh component you want whether it is some kind of input or some kind of special output component whatever you need gotcha 
Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I would want to check out the, um, uh, actually get into some of, some of our experiments and see how we're, I mean, I, I, I know we're using LSL. Um, I, I don't know if you, are you familiar with lab streaming layer? No, no. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, I, I can totally understand why, uh, it, it's something that is, somewhat specialized in, in, you know, research. Um, you know, it started as, as a way to synchronize a number of devices that don't have, you know, like trigger control. Um, mm -hmm. so it, it, in particular, like, uh, like wireless, you know, you know, devices that are Bluetooth only, right. There's no way to kind of, you know, trigger them with a, with a diode or with a TTL or something like that, right? And um, uh, so, lab streaming layer is is a, a, you can think of as like almost like an NTP based synchronization tool to to synchronize clocks. 